The first day I went to school in the U.S., my mom, you know, again, coming from Pakistan, like, you know, wanted me to wear a suit and a bow tie to look nice because, you know, their idea is very different, you know. So I walked into school with like a suit on with a bow tie and I was like, hello, my name is Usman, how are you? You know, and uh, uh, they beat me up that day. Like I jumped three times the same first day. Yeah. Same day. Same day, uh, big black eye, ripped shirt, bow tie gone, all that, came home. And my parents were divorced, you know, it was a very secular household. We weren't religiously inclined. When I was around 10, like I knew the gang I, like they would know me i used to fight a lot because again people would make fun or students have screws loose in their head to begin with so it would just end up being a fight when i was 12 i had an irani friend he was not muslim i didn't have any muslim friends growing up you know so his family was from iran they were shia but they became christian to get a visa to the u.s during the revolution there so his family were all christians but he was irani and like i was pakistani so like you know in school we're the only yeah. two semi middle eastern guys so i used to hang out with him but he liked to start fights so he picked a fight with these guys from a gang called lomas 27 series a Latino gang and they started beating him up and I saw him I jumped in and I started fighting and he ran away <laughs> and uh, three guys beat me up though when I went home I was pretty bashed up you know they were older guys so my mother called my father he didn't live with us so he came and I remember it very clearly so he he pulled up he had this old Camaro like you know at that time it was new and he pulled me in a room by myself and he told me, uh, I only have two questions. Did you run? I said, no. He said, did you cry? I said, no. I said, okay, we're good then. So he grabbed a baseball bat and <laughs> got in the car and said, let's go find him. So we drove around and the gangs have particular areas where they post up. Like this is their, they have to represent the hood. So I knew where they would be. We went there. We saw them. I told my father, that's them. We both jumped out. He took a bat. He hit one guy in the head. My father cracked one's shoulder, uh, shattered his shoulder. And the other guy, he cracked his head. And again, my father was, you know, it was a tough guy, so they ran. The problem got to be is then my father drove off and went to his house <laughs> and I had to go to school the next day. So I very clearly remember going to school the next day and I remember just walking down the hallway and people going, hey, there's that dead kid. You know, the one that's going to get killed today. <laughs> oh. Lomas 27th Street was about, you know, about 500 strong. I was by myself, 12-year-old kid. And we had just cracked one guy's head and broke that guy's shoulder. So basically they were going to wait till school's over and they were going to roll up from the high school because this is elementary school, but they would come from the high school to mess with us. And oh. Older guys. Older guys, yeah. And it was going to be my death that day. So another gang called Eastside San Diego, also Sorenios, they approached me. They said, look, we, we've seen you around. You can fight and stand your ground. If you don't want to die, join us. And Eastside was about a 600 people strong gang. And they didn't like Loma Street to begin with. So they were like, you join us, we'll protect you. So that's how I, at 12 years of age, got into gangs. So basically, when I got involved in gangs, I mean, it wasn't like robberies and little things. It was a lot of bigger stuff. We used to work with the cartels. I mean, San Diego is the last city before right Tijuana. Buddha, yeah. So all the drugs that come into the U.S., they go. And Tijuana, Mexico is the most dangerous city in the world. If you Google the highest murder rate in the world, uh, in one year they had 2,800 murders just in that city. We had people who would go and sell drugs on the streets. I wasn't one of them. I was part of the more people that planned things. So we used to go down to Tijuana, meet with the cartel guys. We would facilitate bringing the drugs in. We would take guns from the U.S. to them and they would pay us in drugs. And then we would then sell those on the streets. We did like robberies. Uh, we also did hits for them. Right? So if they wanted somebody killed in the U.S., they wouldn't send a guy from TJ. They would just tell one of us, like, hey, here's a guy, here's money. So the first friend I saw get killed, I was 14. But it's one of the things that still kind of haunts me sometimes because he got shot right, in the head. And as you know, what you see in the movies of how people get shot is not reality, right? It's not like a little hole. And then like, you know, the Indian movies, like the blood's dripping, the guy's still <laughs> running. You know, he got shot, you know, he had a bullet hole and then the back of his head was gone, but he was still like, you know, it wasn't like he, he didn't, he wasn't gone. He was still breathing. And I remember holding him and the worst thing is you, you kind of had to, you were like, it's going to be okay. But, but you look at him and you know, it's it. not back of his head's gone. The exit hole is definitely bigger and worse. And, and he died. Like I was holding him and he died and I was 14 and we buried him. That was the first of many, you know, and then we, we would shoot them, they would shoot us. A lot of my friends got killed. One of my friends got stabbed in the heart with a screwdriver in front of me and died and stuff. But what happened is the gang had a leadership, you know, we used to call the carnales, like the big guys, the shot callers, the OGs, you know, and I was a part of that, right? So there was, there'd be 13, you know, members, those would be the leadership council. And we had a rule, blood in, blood out, you know, you can understand what blood in means, but blood out means you 
get killed to leave. I mean, you never leave, right? Yeah. So one of the guys that was also on that council, he was a very good friend of mine, grew up with him since I was young. I mean, since basically uh, I got to the U.S. He was two years older than me. And he was very, you know, again, like I know there are gang members and it's kind of a strange thing to say, but he was a really nice guy. You know what I mean? Like he kind of looked out for me like an older brother, right? My father didn't live with us. I didn't have any older siblings. I was the only child. So, you know, even in school or out, he was somebody that was very close to me. And what would happen is we would set up these hits back and forth. So let's say you're a leader in another gang and you, know, you did something to somebody in our gang. Now we want to hit you. Well, we can't really just walk up in your hood because you're going to be protected. So we, we would make these plans, right? Like, okay, where's he going to be? So this girl came up to me at a party and she gave me a number and, you know, she was wanted to meet up. And at that time, when you were in that kind of situation, you would get a lot of attention, not just because of your looks or something, but because you could facilitate a lot of things for a lot of people. I had another girl that contacted me about so what, I mean, I, my mom was very strict, right? So if I wanted to go do stuff, what would I do? I would go stay at my friend's house. And his parents would tell my mother, yeah, yeah, they're going to be in bed by nine. But, you know, we'd do whatever. So Saturday night, I was spending the night at that same friend's house. And, you know, he used to have a garage where we used to sell drugs and have guns and stuff. And then he had an inner house, which nobody was allowed in. That's where his grandmother and parents and all lived. But with me, he was that close that I would stay inside the house, you know, and I would speak to his family and all that. So Saturday night, I was staying at his house and I told him, hey, you know, I got these two at the same time. I don't know what to do. So he's like, well, give me one. I'll take one. You take the other. I said, all right. I gave him one number and I took the other. And what happened is he called and and basically she said, you know, meet me at this payphone and call me and I'll come out and get you. So he went and when he got to the payphone, he rang the number. Instead of her coming out, a bunch of guys came out and they shot him. It was a setup. But the setup was for me. Qadarallah. So, I mean, months they had planned this out, you know, when I met her and then she kept in touch with me, but she was working for them. So all that, you know, was just a setup. Now, I didn't know. I was out and the next morning got a call and they said, he's dead. What? What do you mean he's dead? He was doing this last night. He's like, no, nah, it was a setup. And it hit me hard. I felt guilty. It was a different feeling because... He's a close friend as well. Very close. Very good guy. He was always protective over me. and It was meant to be me. So I went to his funeral. First I saw him and he had been shot nine times. So I mean the bullets were, I, don't, I mean I don't know how many bullets they shot. It was multiple shooters and stuff. And, but it was a 357 bullet that went through his head. So the back of the head was gone. And front had holes and shoulder, hand, chest, you know body was all holed up and you know, you know somebody since you're a young kid I mean like I said I'd seen other people die but this was a very close friend and it was supposed to have been me so I was just imagining myself there so we had a lot of money you know like we used to bring drugs I mean uh, we couldn't put it in a bank we couldn't buy property we couldn't invest so what we do is we'd buy cars and put expensive rims on them and so we had a really nice 64 Impala with rims and hydraulics and paint job and custom seats and all that and it was I was 18 at the time so I mean it's not like it wasn't really mine it was ours together from the money that we all got from the drug trade and stuff and he used to take care of that car like he was really into cars i wasn't really a car guy like but he was really like he would wash it and clean it and all that stuff and i saw his brothers were driving the car and he had 13 girlfriends not girls that he slept with who knows but 13 that were like his girlfriends like that they all knew about each other and all that you know and each one of them was at the funeral but crying on some other guy's shoulder i mean i watched this you know, I watched those girls go home with another guy. I went to his house. I was very close to his family. And obviously his mother was having a panic attack and his grandmother was crying. And, but his brothers were already fighting over his things. And, you know, at that time we had these jackets called Ben Davis. They were heavy jackets and they were like expensive. For us, they were expensive, you know. So his brothers were already fighting over that. And he used to store his money at home. I knew where he kept it. We were all trust. It was gone. Like his brothers already taken it, you know. And I just started thinking, you know, what's life about? Money was something important to us. But he didn't take any of it. Girls, no girl went into the grave with him. They all walked out with somebody else. Power, you know, we used to have clout. I mean, alhamdulillah, I started to study different religions. Like I, I, I realized there's more to life. Then when I left, I basically just stopped hanging out. I started going to the masjid. I started reading Quran. I didn't know how to read Alif Bata. I didn't know how to read Quran. I didn't know how to pray. I mean, I knew some basics like I'd seen my family, but I didn't really know. So I started to go to like a madrasa, you know, even though I was, now I started to get a regular job. I couldn't sell drugs anymore, right? And now I was trying to go to college because I wanted to get my life together. So the gang called me. They're like, hey, where you been? I haven't seen you for a while. And I was like, well, you know, I'm Muslim, you know, and they were like, okay. 
and you know i was like no no like i'm really muslim now like i'm not i can't do this stuff anymore and i remember they were like look we're catholics and christians and you're muslim and that's all good i mean you do you right that's all good but gang is gang like that comes first right you know whatever and i was like nah unlike you guys i, I can't do that like i can't just go confess i can't just be like jesus died for my sins like if i'm muslim i'm muslim like i gotta live it like i can't tell drugs anymore i can't be partying can't. and they were like well i mean you know the rules, blood in, blood out, you know, you, whatever rules you want to follow is up to you. And they were very respectful, like, of religion generally, right? They were very respectful of clergy, like, of priests, but the rules are rules, right? And if you don't obey by the rules, then what do you have, right? Chaos. So I was like, all right, well, I mean, you know me, and you know what I have done, what I can do, and I know you, and if you come, it's not going to be easy. It is what it is, right? And that was probably the most stressful time in my life, because... I wasn't worried about myself. I considered myself dead already, right? Because so many times you'd been shot at and stuff that, you know. But what I was worried about is they're going to shoot the house and they're going to kill my mom. That's what I cared about, you know. And, and I couldn't live with that, you know, that my mom gets hurt because of me. So at that time, I used to have an attic. The attic had a vent to the street. So, you know, those like little... So I would st spend the night there with a gun just waiting. And I knew how it was going to be done because I was part of the enforcement before. They would wait till 4 a.m., 5 a.m., Fajr time because gang members would stay up late. But by that time, you get drowsy and you just pass out. And then they just shoot up the whole house. So I was just waiting. And a day went by and two days and three days. And, and the stressful thing was they knew everything about me. They knew my schedule. They knew where I lived. They knew my family. They knew everything. After a while, I started thinking, you know, I used to roll with these guys. And we went through crazy experiences together. We were shot at. We were stabbed. We shot at others. We were arrested. And we didn't rat on each other. We were pulled by police. And all of that that we lived through, I owe it to them to at least tell them about Islam. If it changed me, maybe it would change them. And I felt guilty. Like I felt like, okay, I got this amazing thing, Islam, that now I realize the purpose of life is not sell drugs or party. And now I realize there's a greater purpose and why we exist and why we were created in Jannah and Jahannam. But these guys don't know this stuff. So I said, I'm going to go to the hood. I had started to grow my beard. I was wearing a thobe, my mama, you know, so I yeah. changed. And I wasn't going to go armed because I'm not going to take them on. Like, right. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to go. So I started walking and I can't imagine like what they were thinking. Like some guy in a robe is coming. Like, I don't know what code they sent, but they didn't recognize me at first because I was, you know, when I got close and they looked at my face and they recognized me, they were like, like, what are you doing here? Like, are you crazy? Like, you know, and I remember one of my friends that I grew up with that, you know, he was still an active uh, gang member. He told me, look, I don't know what you're doing here, but I sort of God, you're not going to walk out of here alive. We were sitting here thinking, how are we going to kill you? You just came here and then they patted me down. I was like, I'm not armed, you know? And they were like, you're crazy. Like, you're going to die here. You know, there's no way you're going to walk out of here. At that time, I was like, all right, well, it is what it is, right? I mean, how long are you going to live looking over your back, whatever? So I told him, look, let me just talk to you. Give me five minutes. Let me just tell you something, what changed me, and then do whatever you got to do. So I started talking about Islam. I'm talking like, like, look, you know, this guy got killed. This guy got killed. Where is his family today? You know, look at the hardship. His mom crying. You're going to get killed for what? Like, for what, what drugs are you going to take with you? What money are you going to take with you? This guy just got stabbed. This guy got this. This guy's doing the rest of his life. His kids are messed up because he's never going to get out of prison. What's it for? What, what's all that money going to do for him in prison? There's no girls in prison. There's no fun in prison. There's no ice cream, no sunshine. What, what's the point? And of course, they, they had the same thoughts, you know? So it resonated because whatever I was going through, they were going through. So two and a half hours later, uh, one of them, the OG, told me, look, we're going to give you a pass. Let's go. Just get out of here. We don't want to ever see you. Don't ever get in the hood. Don't ever let us see you. Just go. And in religion, we respect it. Leave. I told him, no. I told him, look, I'll leave on one condition. You guys come to the masjid. Just one time. We'll make food for you. We'll sit down in a good environment, not this kind of place. And just come. And we're like... <laughs> This guy is crazy, you know, like we're letting him live and now he's putting more conditions on us. And then, then after a while, they're like, all right, fine, we'll come. Now, again, there were 600, not all of them came. Maybe, you know, I forgot, maybe like 70 or 60, some of them, many of them, maybe 20, I don't remember. Like a lot of them came, not the same day. Alhamdulillah, 12 of them became Muslim, you know. Wow. Uh, look, it's not a fairy tale, right? Some of them still got killed. I mean, it's not a movie, like this is reality. It is what it is, right? One of them, he had killed somebody's cousin and even though he left the gang world and he was coming to the masjid, one day they saw him at a store and they shot him. One of them ended up, you know, he used to sleep around a lot. He had AIDS, you know, he died from it. Some of them got locked up for stuff they had done in the past. But I can tell you, Alhamdulillah, I still know some of them and they're Muslim and they left that world. They had to leave San Diego and stuff. So Alhamdulillah, and he, some of them did become Muslim. 